Hi everyone. Today we are going to be talking about Reconstruction, which refers to the period immediately following the Civil War in which uh, the South especially, and a little bit the North, uh, have to reconstruct the country that has been broken apart by the Civil War. And so we're going to be dealing with a lot of different issues here, uh, particularly in the South, to try to reunify the country, rebuild uh, the country and to deal with some of the social issues that are going to result um, from the end of the Civil War. So we've got a couple of different problems that the North and South are going to be facing uh, after the conclusion of the Civil War. For the North, we're mostly going to be seeing some economic difficulties that are going to be temporary for the North. Um, they have an issue with employment, about 80 sorry, 800,000 uh, veterans are returning to the North and they need jobs. Meanwhile, uh, factories are laying off workers in large numbers because the war production that they were uh, participating in is now done. And so they're not going to be needing as many workers. So you kind of have all these people coming back from the war who need jobs and those jobs are not available. But Economic recovery in the North is going to be a lot easier than it will be in the South. Uh, the North lost more soldiers than the South, but they didn't have the same number of battles and level of destruction that the South saw. And so they're not going to have to rebuild their cities in the same way that the South will. Um, they're not going to have as many of those issues happening. They're not going to have to contend with slavery, the end of slavery in the same way, or any of those things. So the temporary problems in the North will uh, sort of work themselves out as we go through Reconstruction um, a lot more smoothly than we see in the South. The South, on the other hand, is dealing with a ton of very deep-seated problems. One is mass destruction of their infrastructure. Um, if you remember, at the end of the Civil War, um, the Union instituted a policy of total war in which uh, the Union soldiers and their commanders would literally destroy everything in their path. Uh, in the South in an attempt to, um, to destroy food sources and railroads and things like that. And so houses, barns, bridges, some cities had been totally destroyed by the war. And so the South is going to quite literally have to rebuild uh, so much of, uh, of their infrastructure in the South. The South is also facing financial ruin. Um, Confederate money is now worthless now that the Confederacy doesn't exist. Um, many of the loans that were made to the Confederacy were never going to be repaid by the Confederacy. They don't have any money. Um, and a lot of the Southern banks had to close down as a result. And so people lost the savings that they had in those banks. Um, not to mention just the cost of the war, uh, paying the soldiers, and then having to contend with the costs of rebuilding as well. Those are going to be some major financial burdens for the South. And then, of course, we have drastic social changes happening in the South. We are going almost overnight um, from having a, a society that is built on slavery um, to four million freedmen, men and women who had been slaves and have now been freed um, as a result of the passage of the 13th Amendment at the beginning of 1865. Um, and these slaves, or these former slaves now, uh, are going to have no property. Um, most of them will be illiterate, as it was illegal for slaves to learn how to read and write. Um, and so these freedmen are going to be at a distinct disadvantage in American society um, with very few options for them uh, at this time. Not to mention, they are now suddenly free in a society that essentially hates them. Um, racism does not die with the end of the Civil War. And so you have a society that now has all of these free Blacks living with and among um, the people who had enslaved them. Um, and so this is going to cause a lot of tension. And of course, whites are going to try to hold on to, um, hold on to what little power they have left. Um, and try to push down uh, free blacks now uh, that we're seeing. So this is going to be a major period of uh, growing pains for the United States uh, as we try to contend with all of these post-war problems.
Now, as I said before, Reconstruction refers to the rebuilding uh, of the South specifically, um, but also applies to uh, the country in general. We're going to get a couple of different plans uh, for how to go about doing this. Lincoln's plan is focused on reunifying the North and South. That is his main goal. He doesn't want to be very punitive towards the South because he wants to welcome uh, sometimes quite literally uh, brothers and sisters back into uh, the Union. So his plan for Reconstruction is called the 10% Plan. He felt that Southern states could reform their governments once only 10% of voters pledged loyalty to the United States. Um, states must, of course, abolish slavery. And then voters could then vote for their congressmen and participate in national government if they met those first two points. And he wanted to grant amnesty to uh, the Confederates. Um, so amnesty is a government pardon. Um, so this is going to apply to Confederates who swore their loyalty. Um, this is not going to apply to uh, actual Confederate leaders. So people like Jefferson Davis um, will not be included in here. Um, but everyone else in the South would be granted amnesty under Lincoln's plan. Now, a lot of people felt that this was way too lenient of a plan. They wanted to be uh, a little firmer with the South. Um, and so we get the Wade Davis bill as another proposed plan. This would require a majority of Southern white men to pledge their loyalty to the U.S. as opposed to just 10% of them. And it would deny voting rights and the ability to hold public office to anyone who'd volunteered for the Confederate Army. So if you were in the Confederacy and you did not join the Army, um, you would be allowed to vote anyone who volunteered for the army would not be able to vote. So that would be a huge blow to the South and their ability to, um, to participate in government. And so Lincoln refused to sign the Way Davis bill. He felt it was way too harsh uh, for the South. Now, one other part of Reconstruction plans is the Freedmen's Bureau, the establishment of this government agency created to help former slaves. And it was created in 1865 and went a long way to helping freedmen uh, find their place in this new white society that they were joining as free people rather than slaves. So the Freedmen's Bureau gave food and clothing to former slaves. Uh, they helped freedmen find jobs. And they also provided services for poor whites who had been affected by the war as well. Um, and so the Freedmen's Bureau provides about 1 million blacks and whites medical care. Um, and the big thing that the Freedmen's Bureau does is establishes schools for freedmen. Um, this is going to be the foundation for the Southern public school system uh, that we'll see develop over time. And it also created a lot of African-American colleges, some of our historically black colleges that you might have heard of. Fisk University uh, is created in 1866. And then in 1867, we get Howard University, a really famous one, and Morehouse College as well. And a lot of the graduates from those schools uh, became teachers themselves. Um, so we get a lot of African-American teachers trying to teach other free Blacks how to read and write and, and learn about uh, math, science, history, and all those things. Um, now, one important note uh, to make here is that these schools are not going to be just elementary age children or young kids. Uh, it's going to include uh, adults as well. You can see kind of in this picture here, we have children who are in the school. We also have adults who are learning as well, some elderly people. Um, because like I said before, pretty much all slaves uh, did not have the opportunity to learn. Um, and so most of them are illiterate. Um, and so they're going to be attending these schools as well so they can function in society. All right. Now, one major blow to this process is Lincoln's assassination, a major blow to the country. This is the first president in our history who is assassinated. Um, and this is going to come just five days after General Lee surrenders, so five days after the official end of the war. Um, some of the fighting is still even going on at this point. Um, so April 14th, 1865, Lincoln attended a play at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. with his wife uh, and a couple of other people. Um, a Southern actor named John Wilkes Booth snuck into the uh, theater box that they were in 
and snuck up behind Lincoln and shot him in the head. Um, and the president was dead by the next morning. Now this, like I said, is going to be a major blow to the country um, and very shocking for a lot of people. Booth was later caught and killed. Um, and so Vice President Andrew Johnson is going to have to take office um, after Lincoln has passed. Now, Andrew Johnson was a former congressional representative for Tennessee. And if you remember, Tennessee was one of the states that seceded uh, from the Union. But he remained loyal even after Tennessee left and, of course, becomes uh, vice president. Um, now, I mentioned that because we want to remember that Andrew Jan Johnson uh, has a bit of a racist streak to him. Um, and that's going to play in to his story later on. Johnson's plan for Reconstruction, however, uh, was a little harsher than Lincoln's, uh, but again, people still thought it was too lenient. His plan was that the majority of Southerners should pledge their loyalty to the U.S. Each state would be required to ratify the 13th Amendment, which freed the slaves, and he would ban slavery throughout the country. So not just in the South, but in the Western territories and um, in the North as well. So a lot of the southern states met these conditions. Johnson approved their state governments in late 1865. And so southerners started electing representatives uh, to uh, meet in Congress. Um, and some of these representatives that they elected were former Confederate leaders. For example, Alexander Stevens, who had been the former Confederate vice president. Um, so you can imagine a lot of the Republicans in Congress were very outraged by this. They don't want any of the Confederate leaders having a say in the new government. They're worried that that will cause all kinds of problems and tensions. Um, and they're trying to rebuild. They don't want any remnants of uh, the Confederacy holding out uh, in positions of power. Um, and then the southern states and their new governments did not allow African Americans to vote. Um, so not a single southern state allowed African Americans to vote, which of course is going to be a major issue. Um, these freed slaves are going to have to participate in some way, and they need to be able to vote uh, if we're going to um, have a unified society. So the new Congress meets with uh, some of these Southern representatives, and Republicans decided to set up a joint committee on Reconstruction to try to develop a new plan, something other than what Johnson had in store. Now, one thing that the South did in this interim period is created what are called the Black Codes. These are laws that severely limited the rights of freedmen. And the main purpose of them was to keep freedmen from gaining any political and economic power. They still want to keep uh, African Americans down, um, keep them enslaved in as many ways as possible without actually uh, having them be slaves because that's illegal now. So they forbade freedmen the right to vote. They were not allowed to own guns or serve on juries, which are all uh, rights that are guaranteed to citizens in the United States, although this doesn't apply just yet to African Americans. But the Bill of Rights does um, permit everyone to be able to own guns and people need to be able to serve on juries and have a right to due process of law uh, and so on. And so the Black Codes, the Black, black Codes, sorry, um, block African Americans from, from participating. African Americans were only allowed to work as servants or farm laborers in some states. Um, so servants and farm labor, that is the work of slaves. And so they reserved those jobs for uh, African Americans. So it's really not going to be very different in the South uh, to start out here. Uh, African Americans were also required to sign year-long contracts for work. And if you did not have a contract, you could be arrested and sentenced to work on plantations. Uh, so again, slavery in all but name. There was also a lot of violence against freemen as a, as a result of the Black Codes. Um, in Memphis, Tennessee in 1866, there was a riot um, where whites killed about 40 African Americans. Um, they burned their homes, their churches, their schoolhouses. Um, and tried to intimidate African Americans. We also see riots break out in New Orleans, uh, Louisiana, um, when blacks met to uh, support the right to vote. 
They were trying to gain some autonomy in society. And um, again, whites rioted um, against this effort. Now, the Republicans overall rejected Johnson's plan. They said it was way too lenient. Um, they felt that it encouraged Southerners to bl- pass the Black Codes by giving them so much freedom in creating their state governments. And they basically felt that the South was trying to preserve slavery as long as possible, like I said, in all but name. And so a new group forms in Congress called the Radical Republicans. These are going to be members of Congress during Reconstruction who wanted to ensure that freedmen received the right to vote. That's going to be one of their main goals. Okay. And so the Radical Republicans are going to be led by Representative Thaddeus Stevens, who uh, was a major figure in passing the 13th Amendment, and Senator Charles Sumner, who we mentioned before the war, uh, he was almost beat to death on the Senate floor, if you remember that story. Now, the goals of the Radical Republicans were twofold. One, they wanted to break the power of wealthy Southern planters who held most of the power traditionally in the South. Um, So by trying to break that power, they could then Uh, ensure that freedmen had gained the right to vote. And so that's what they're going to try to do uh, going forward. But they needed support from a lot of the more moderate Republicans. Um, And so the Republicans are going to kind of band together here uh, on behalf of freedmen to try to uh, reconstruct um, a new country in which African Americans are allowed to participate as free men. So in 1866, Congress passes the Civil Rights Act. Um, It gave citizenship to African Americans, but they were worried that this would eventually be overturned by the Supreme Court. So they're going to take that Civil Rights Act a step further and uh, try to pass the 14th Amendment. Now, Johnson vetoed the Civil Rights Act, uh, but Congress was able to override that veto with their two-thirds vote uh, in the Senate. And so the Civil Rights Act passes. But again, they're worried that the Supreme Court might overturn the Civil Rights Act by declaring that African Americans are not citizens, um, as they had done in the Dred Scott case uh, that went up to the Supreme Court. So the 14th Amendment is going to be put in place to declare that African Americans are indeed citizens, to make sure once and for all that African Americans are entitled to the rights of American citizens. So the 14th Amendment, um, the main thing that it does is define citizenship. It says that all persons are, who are born or naturalized in the United States are American citizens. Um, now, this applies to African Americans, but it does not apply to Native Americans. Um, so we're going to see some, some issues with that with Native Americans uh, going forward in American history. But for now, this is going to include African Americans. It also guaranteed that citizens... Uh, who is everyone born or naturalized in the United States, has equal protection of the laws. So no matter who you are, what color skin you have, if you've been a slave before or not, every citizen has equal protection of the laws. And so when those laws are applied, they need to be applied equally to everyone. Um, And we see this um, even today. This does not always uh, play out the way that it should. Uh, The 14th Amendment also forbade any states from depriving any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And so um, you have to go through the process of being arrested, charged, tried. You're entitled to a trial by jury. uh, And that whole process before your life can be taken with, say, um, uh, a death penalty or something, before you can be imprisoned. Um, for your sentence or before any property can be seized. You have to go through that due process. Um, And so what we're seeing right now with uh, a lot of the issues with race, um, especially when it comes to police brutality, um, a lot of people cite the 14th Amendment as being violated um, because even in the arrest process, um, a lot of young African-American, especially men, um, are being denied that right to life. A lot, of, uh, a lot of young men are being killed before they can even be charged with a crime or, or imprisoned or anything like that. And so in the recent uh, days where we've been talking about George Floyd especially, um, a lot of people have pointed to the 14th Amendment 
um, as being violated for, for some of those issues. Uh, four, states could not legally discriminate against any citizens based on unreasonable grounds. So, for example, race. Um, so the 14th Amendment is specifically dealing with, uh, with this issue of race. And then five, any state that denied uh, a male citizen who was 21 years or older the right to vote or the right to equal process, uh, equal protection or due process, um, they would lose representatives. Um, so this was kind of built in to say to the Southern states, you need to comply with this amendment or you're going to lose your say in, uh, in Congress. Uh, now, like I mentioned, the fight to protect African Americans 14th Amendment rights still continues today. We're seeing this with the Black Lives Matter movement uh, and police brutality in our country. Um, and so there's a lot of parallels to uh, this time of reconstruction um, uh, that we're seeing. Okay. Now, the election of 1866 uh, was a turning point for the Republicans. The Republicans won majorities in both the House and the Senate, which meant that they would be able to get a lot of their goals uh, worked through and a lot of their laws passed with so many Republicans uh, to vote in favor of them. Um, so we get radical reconstruction. Uh, this is the period when Republicans can take charge of reconstruction uh, beginning in 1867. And so the first thing they do is pass the Reconstruction Act, which is going to be the official reconstruction policy that we'll see going forward uh, after all those different plans we saw. So the Reconstruction Act requires new state constitutions for the Southern states. So a lot of them had written state constitutions under Johnson's plan. Those have to be thrown out and rewritten. Um, in order to rejoin the Union. And the exception is Tennessee, who had already rejoined the Union. Um, and those new state constitutions had to be approved by Congress. So we see Congress taking a much more um, uh, hands-on approach to Reconstruction. It also divided the South into five military districts where an army commander would be given powers to enforce Reconstruction and make sure that the states were complying with the policies of the Reconstruction Act. And then third, the Southern states would be required to ratify the 13th Amendment and allow African Americans the right to vote. Um, and so once the Reconstruction Act was passed, these reconstructed states held elections for their state governments. Um, and a lot of the freedmen who now had the right to vote in those states voted for Republicans. Republicans are the ones who are um, making sure that freedmen have rights. And so, of course, they're going to vote for those same people. Um, and so a lot of the new Southern governments uh, were controlled by Republicans. So you can imagine how Southern Democrats are going to uh, respond to this. Okay, so here we have just a map of the military zones that were set up, the five different dr districts, lumping a couple of states together. Um, and having control over those regions. And like I said, Tennessee is uh, excused from that. Now, Johnson was supposed to execute the laws um, and enforce them. So he's supposed to, um, to enforce the Reconstruction Act of 1867. But instead, he found ways to limit its effectiveness. Um, and one way that he did this was by firing military commanders who supported radical reconstruction and replacing them with commanders who didn't support it, who were against it. Um, and so this, of course, undermines the ability of the Reconstruction Act to, um, to carry out its policies. So in response, in February of uh, 1868, the House of Representatives, again, controlled by Republicans, voted to impeach uh, President Johnson. Um, and if you remember, impeach refers to bringing formal charges against uh, the president. Now, according to the Constitution, the House may impeach a president for uh, any of these things, treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. So there's a lot of wiggle room about what that means. Um, and then the president can be removed only by a two-thirds vote in the Senate. 
Now, both the House and the Senate are controlled by Republicans at this point. Um, But the Senate ultimately declared that Johnson was not guilty of any high crimes and misdemeanors. And this is very significant. Um, When you have a House that is controlled by uh, one party, chances are they are going to go along with that party line. And the party line at this point is uh, impeaching President Johnson. And so... um, a lot of the senators in Congress decided that um, the impeachment was mostly political and that Johnson indeed had not committed uh, high crimes and misdemeanors. So Johnson is able to complete his term in office and he leaves office uh, once we get a new president uh, in the election of 1868. So the Republicans nominated Ulysses S. Grant for president, one of our uh, favored commanding officers during the uh, the Civil War, and about five hundred thousand African American men voted, uh, almost all of them for Grant in the election of eighteen sixty eight, um, and so Grant wins and takes over the presidency, and during his presidency, the Fifteenth Amendment is passed. The Fifteenth Amendment forbade states from denying any citizen the right to vote because of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. So they want to protect the right to vote for not just Southern Blacks, but Northern Blacks as well. Um, Now, if you remember, the North was not uh, innocent of racism. Uh, A lot of people in the North are super racist um, during this time. They're going to try to block free Blacks from from participating freely in society um, and even block them from voting. And so the 15th Amendment is meant to address not just the voting issues in the South, but also in the North. So the 15th Amendment is ratified in 1870, just two years after the election, um, and uh, guarantees the right to vote for all citizens. Except, I'll point out, this deals with race, color, and previous conditions of servitude. It does not mention gender. Um, And so women still are denied the right to vote. Uh, at this point in time. All right, so these are our three amendments. Um, These are sometimes called the Reconstruction Amendments or sometimes the Civil War Amendments. The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments are usually lumped together. The 13th Amendment, of course, ended slavery in the United States, ratified in 1865. The 14th Amendment, as we said, defines citizenship and guarantees equal protection under the law and due process for all citizens. And the 15th Amendment gives all men the right to vote regardless of their status. Okay. Now, Southern, Dem- uh, Southern politics really changed during Reconstruction as well. Traditionally, Southern politics had been dominated by rich planters, and they were losing power in the new state governments that were mostly Republican-controlled. Um, and so we're going to get a lot of white Southern Republicans These are going to be supporters of the new Republican government. And a lot of them were business people who had opposed secession back in 1860. And they're going to get this nickname, Scalawags. Uh, It's the name for white Southern Republicans who who favored the new governments. Um, And this is going to be a name ascribed to them by white Southerners who felt that the Republicans were traitors to the South. So even within the South, we see some some divisions happening. We also have Northerners who migrated to the South during Reconstruction. These guys are going to be called carpetbaggers, Northerners, men and women, who came to the South after the war. Now, some of the people coming to the South are hoping to profit from rebuilding in the South. And so they kind of get a negative um, reputation because they're just trying to make some money off of the South. But a lot of them are Union soldiers who had fallen in love with the South uh, in their in the time that they'd spent there. And then some people are going to be black and white teachers, ministers, and reformers who are coming to the South uh, because they want to help freedmen. Um, and so they're going to do uh, various programs and try to help freedmen adjust to this new society. All right. African Americans also drastically change the face of Southern politics. They are voting at this point in large numbers once the 15th Amendment guarantees them that right. Um, And they are electing African Americans to public offices, sheriffs, mayors, 
and even legislators. Between 1869 and 1880, there are 16 African Americans elected to the U.S. Congress. The first black senator in 1870 was Hiram Revels, who's pictured right here. And the first African American to serve a full term in the Senate uh, was Blanche K. Bruce in 1874. So African Americans participating in Southern politics is really going to make a lot of Southern white Democrats nervous um, because they see the power, the stronghold that they had in the South very quickly being overturned. And of course, again, you have this issue of this was my former slave and now they're making policies that affect me. Um, and so that's not going to sit very well uh, with Southern whites. Okay. So there's a lot of resistance to the new Reconstruction plan, the radical Reconstruction, and that's going to come from conservatives. So these are going to be white Southerners who resisted the changes of Reconstruction. Many of these conservatives were Southern Democrats who wanted government to take action against freedmen rather than building them up. And this is kind of strange for us to think about right now because today we associate conservatives with the Republican Party and liberals with the Democratic Party. But these shifts happen over time. And we're going to see in the, the 1960s that um, this shift will happen to the, um, the situation that we have now where Democrats are more liberal and Republicans are more conservative. But in the 1860s and 70s, conservatives are going to be these Southern Democrats. And the more liberal side of uh, the political spectrum is going to go to the Republicans. A lot of conservatives were also small farmers and laborers who are now competing with freedmen for jobs. Um, freedmen don't have a lot of options for jobs, and so they're going to work on small farms and work as laborers uh, because that's what they know how to do. And so if you are a white farmer or a white laborer, you're now competing with uh, black men and women for those same jobs. And so they don't want that kind of competition. Conservatives wanted power to remain in the hands of whites when it came to both the political side of things and uh, the economy. Um, and so they want as few changes as possible. Now, conservatives are not against change, but conservatives uh, traditionally will be in favor of change if it is a slow process. And so all throughout uh, American history up to uh, the 1960s or so, um, we're going to see these conservatives uh, when it comes to racial issues. Um, some people will be in favor of eventually um, making more uh, or giving more rights to African Americans, but they just want it to be a very, very slow, gradual process. And of course, that's not acceptable at this point. Um, the African Americans are no longer slaves and they need to be able to function in society. And so their main goal for the conservatives right now, uh, resisting reconstruction, are trying to force African Americans back onto plantations. They want uh, African Americans to be in that inferior position in society. And so uh, one group that is formed uh, out of this resistance is the Ku Klux Klan, uh, a secret society that worked to keep both African Americans and Republicans out of office. And their main goal is to terrorize black voters, burning wooden crosses outside their homes and making threats, uh, especially when it came to voters. Um, the KKK also murdered hundreds of African Americans and white allies at this point. Uh, so this could be done through lynching. Uh, lynching is uh, killing someone uh, before they have been arrested or tried or, or have gone through that due process of law, which of course is violating the 14th Amendment here. And um, the KKK is going to continue to use violence and scare tactics to try to scare African Americans away from voting, even after, after Congress makes it a crime to use force to keep people from voting uh, in 1870. Now, there are a lot of challenges in the South, even in the face of Reconstruction. Uh, it is a very costly endeavor to try to rebuild infrastructure in the South. They're rebuilding schools, railroads, telegraph lines, bridges, and roads. And all of those things cost 
money, tax money. And so Reconstruction governments are going to have to raise taxes. And for a community in the South that is already struggling financially uh, as a result of the war, this is going to be uh, a major financial burden for the South. And it's going to make things more difficult for them as they as they try to reconstruct. There's also widespread corruption and dishonesty in both the North and the South. Um, a lot of the new governments, uh, even Republicans, are using state money to pay for things like horse racing, hams, perfume. There's even one instance where they paid for a coffin, um, things that have nothing to do with the government. So this corruption really turns a lot of people off to uh, the political process. And then, of course, we have extreme poverty for freedmen. Um, just because they are now free from slavery does not mean that they are suddenly in a good position in society. Um, Congress had talked about giving 40 acres and a mule uh, to every free uh, Black person in America, but this never came to fruition. 40 acres and a mule, mule would have um, enabled African Americans to kind of get their foot in the door with uh, creating a life for themselves. But instead, they get nothing but freedom. Um, And so freedom is, of course, necessary. But freedom in and of itself is nothing when you don't have political power, when you don't have economic power. Um, And so a lot of African Americans are going to be facing poverty at this time. Some uh, became landowners themselves, but many returned to work on plantations. That's what they knew how to do. And so they start working as sharecroppers. So this is going to be freedmen and poor whites who rented and farmed a plot of land. And in return, they paid their rent instead of with cash, they paid with a share of the crops that they raise. And so a landowner would allow uh, a tenant, uh, so that would be the sharecropper, to use the land. The, um, the tenant would then get a hold of supplies, usually on credit, so seed, fertilizer, and different tools, because again, African Americans don't have any money uh, at their disposal at this point. And they would repay the loan with profits from the harvest. But the problem was, if the harvest was too low, the sharecroppers didn't make enough money to pay back that debt. They didn't make enough in harvest uh, to to benefit the landowners. And so both the sharecroppers and the landowner, landowners would sometimes suffer. And so this created a cycle of poverty for, uh, for Southerners and especially freedmen. Um, and so that's why we see going into the civil rights movement in the 20th century that um, one of the things that they're fighting for is not just uh, the ability to vote and participate in government, but also the right to jobs and to be paid fair, uh, fair wages, um, because they can't function in society without those two things. Now, Republican power starts to decline. One is a result of corruption that really hurt the Republicans that I talked about a second ago. And a lot of Southerners felt that it was time to run their own governments. Um, and so the Amnesty Act uh, is passed in 1872, which restores the right to vote for all white Southerners. Um, and a lot of those Southerners are going to vote Democrat. So the Republicans start to lose their hold in uh, both federal and state governments. Um, and they also contended with threats of violence uh, to keep African Americans from voting. Um, and so Reconstruction is going to come to an end in uh, 1876 as a result of the election of 1876. Uh, The Republican candidate was Rutherford B. Hayes uh, versus uh, Samuel Tilden, who was the Democratic candidate. Both of them vowed to fight this corruption uh, in the government that was turning so many people off to to politics. Tilden won the popular vote, but was one electoral vote short of winning the election, winning the presidency. And so this becomes a disputed election. So a committee is formed, mostly controlled by Republicans. Um, And so they, of course, um, award the election to Rutherford B. Hayes. So Hayes wins, but he wins and agrees to end Reconstruction. And this really helped uh, Southerners to accept him as, uh, as the president. 
So he re removed all remaining troops from Louisiana, South Carolina, and Florida, and officially ended Reconstruction in 1876. Now, the impact of Reconstruction is threefold. Um, one, it changed Southern politics, um, which had traditionally been dominated by, um, by Democrats. We have that brief stint of Republican power in the South, but once Reconstruction is over, it is re-dominated by the Democratic Party. And we're going to see those conservatives um, really fight against African-Americans and their right to vote. There was also a lot of bitterness towards radical Republican policies, um, things that they felt were overstepping in uh, government power, and especially the military rule in the South. And so that kind of um, plays into this uh, almost like a stereotype that we have in the South, um, this culture of mistrust of authority uh, in the South. A lot of Southerners um, you know, don't like police officers, don't like um, you know, a, a government coming in with the military to uh, you know, put down a, a riot or something like that. Um, and so we still see that today, and it kind of has its roots here in Reconstruction. And then, of course, we also have resentment towards African-American political power. And we're going to see the South work very hard over the next hundred years to, um, to disenfranchise African-Americans and to keep them from having uh, any political and economic power. Okay. So as soon as Reconstruction is over, the South does everything it can to stop African Americans from voting. Of course, their right to vote is supported by the uh, 15th Amendment, but um, the South sort of finds a loophole. And what they do is they institute a poll tax, which requires voters to pay a fee each time they voted. And this is about $2 to vote. Now, most freedmen who are freshly freed from slavery can't afford to pay that. Uh, $2 at that time is going to be a lot more than $2 today. Um, and so they can't pay. So if they can't pay the poll tax, you can't vote. They also instituted a literacy test in the South, which required voters to read and explain a section of the Constitution. Now, a lot of people, even a lot of people today can't do that. Um, and so definitely African-Americans who were born under slavery, who are mostly illiterate, who did not attend school, uh, are not going to be able to pass that literacy test. Now, a lot of whites in the South couldn't pass the literacy test either. And so the South passed what are called grandfather clauses, which said if a voter's father or grandfather was eligible to vote uh, in January of 1867, the voter did not have to take the literacy test. So if I'm a white Southerner, of course my father and grandfather would have been eligible to vote. But if I am a free African American, African Americans didn't get the right to vote until 1868. And so, of course, they're not going to uh, be able to pass the grandfather uh, clause. And so, African Americans are going to be disproportionately affected by the, both the poll tax and the literacy test. And so, the effect is that African American voter registration fell by about 124,000 to 144,000 people. Um, so that's going to be a major blow to African-American political power in the South. You can kind of see in this uh, cartoon here, we have a black man here and a white man who is writing down the qualifications for being able to vote. So it says education qualification. And obviously this is spelled incorrectly. It says the black man ought to be educated before he can vote with us whites. Um, and so uh, it's kind of saying that even whites in the South uh, were not as educated, especially poor whites. Um, and so, uh, so it's really kind of pointing out the unfairness of these uh, voting restrictions. Okay. The South also started passing what are called Jim Crow laws. And this was uh, laws that dealt with segregation. Segregation is the legal separation of races. Um, and oftentimes, segregation is not legal. Um, but in public spaces, it was. Um, so these laws kept blacks and whites separate in public spaces. So trains, schools, restaurants, theaters, 
streetcars, playgrounds, hospitals, and even cemeteries were separated uh, between blacks and whites. So these Jim Crow laws are going to place African Americans in a very difficult position. Um, so a lot of people will I hear people say sometimes like, oh, slavery is over. It's been over for a long time. I don't understand why there's still problems uh, in black communities. And it stems from these Jim Crow laws, this legal segregation. And it applies to pretty much every aspect of society. Um, it applies to housing eventually. It applies to schools. It applies to hospitals. And so we're going to see uh, a lot of these issues carry over into the 20th century and the 21st century as well. Now, one challenge to the Jim Crow laws was the case Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896. Homer Plessy was a light-skinned African-American male, um, and he was only one-eighth African-American. Um, and so he sat in a whites-only section of a rail car and refused to move. So he's arrested, he is put on trial, and his case goes all the way up to the Supreme Court, who eventually rules that segregation is legal as long as the facilities are equal. And so we get this phrase, separate but equal, which justifies segregation all throughout the United States uh, going into the 1950s when this ruling is eventually overturned. Um, unfortunately, facilities were uh, almost never equal between blacks and whites. And you can see that here with this picture of the drinking fountain. And there's lots of different uh, examples of this, but I always feel that this one is the most telling. We have the drinking fountain for whites only and the colored drinking fountain here. Clearly one is, uh, is nicer than the other one. Um, and so this is going to be the case in schools. More funding is going to go to white schools than black schools. Um, so you can imagine the, the long-term impact of poor education for African-Americans. Um, African-Americans will not have access to uh, health care uh, in the same way that whites are. And so we get what is called structural violence or sometimes called systematic racism. Uh, structural violence is systematic ways in which social structures harm or otherwise disadvantage individuals. And this disproportionately affects people of color and people of low socioeconomic status, so poor people. Um, so we're gonna see all through the 20th century and like I said, the 21st century as well today, all kinds of issues related to structural violence where this um, the segregation is sort of built into the system. And this is almost worse than just like outward um, racism because it's harder to see and identify. Um, so when it comes to housing, we're going to see all kinds of issues where uh, African-Americans will be barred from buying houses in uh, white neighborhoods. Um, there is a place in Detroit where there's literally a wall built between the white neighborhood and the black neighborhood. Um, those neighborhoods are integrated today, but uh, when it was first built, it was literally built to divide the neighborhood uh, between black and white. Um, African Americans who are not privy to buying homes are going to suffer long-term economic um, uh, problems um, because they don't have that source of wealth that whites are able to get. Education, the school is being segregated for so long. Uh, we have generations and generations of African Americans who don't have access to good education, good facilities. Um, and so that's going to carry over into today. There are people alive today uh, who went to black schools or went to all, all white schools. Um, so these things are still very much part of our society. In our healthcare systems, um, we're seeing with the coronavirus today um, that minorities are disproportionately affected by. Um, by the coronavirus, by different diseases, because of um, uh, segregation in our healthcare system, even today, or at least bias in our healthcare system. Um, African American adults are over fifty percent more likely to die prematurely from heart disease than than whites are. Um, there are all kinds of studies about uh, about these issues that you can you can take a look at. Political representation, African Americans being disenfranchised from the vote uh, for so long uh, until we get the Voting Rights Act 
in the uh, 1965, um, we're going to see political participation drastically reduced for African Americans. And even today, some of the voter ID laws and, and different restrictions disproportionately, again, affect African American communities. And then, of course, the criminal justice system, which we're seeing protests about right now. Um, in the criminal justice system, um, black males are incarcerated at a much higher rate than, than whites are. One third of black males will be incarcerated in his lifetime. Um, African Americans are sentenced to, um, to jail 20% longer than whites are who committed similar crimes. Um, black people are also targeted for, uh, for drugs. Black people are much more likely to be stopped and searched for drugs, whereas the likelihood of finding something illegal is higher among white people. But again, these are, um, built into our systems, built into the way that we, uh, we think, and we really have to work as a society to move away from this systemic uh, racism in our society that begins back here in Reconstruction and these Jim Crow laws. So these are still things that we're dealing with, and of course we're seeing them happen right now uh, in the last couple of days. Okay. Finally, we get the New South, which is a term that describes the South in the late 1800s once efforts were made to expand the economy and build up their industries. Now, cotton production had recovered by about 1880 in the South. Um, and so a lot of Southern leaders want to start using the South's natural resources to build up their industries instead of depending on the North. So they built their own textile mills. So instead of having to send their cotton North uh, to be processed, they would just process it in their own mills in the South. The tobacco industry grew. Uh, for example, James Duke, who founded the American Tobacco Company, controlled about 90% of the tobacco industry in the South. So that's going to be uh, a good economic uh, development for the South. And then the South started using their natural resources. They had large deposits of iron ore and coal that was used to produce steel and oil. And they used copper, granite, marble, and lumber to produce all kinds of goods, for example, furniture. Um, and so this is a picture of a hotel uh, in the South in the late 1800s. Um, just an example of the rebuilding and restructuring in the South as a result of Reconstruction. And of course, as we go on, the South will continue to grow and expand um, and to recover from uh, the decimation of the Civil War. So we see a lot of parallels to, um, to our own society today reflected in this Reconstruction era. A lot of political division, a lot of social division, racial issues, even the impeachment of the president, which we recently had um, today. Uh, there's a lot of parallels, and we see that as a result of divisions, divisions in our society that run very deep. And so um, the one way to to move forward from these is to, to unify as best we can. Um, and so we're going to have to really pull together as we move forward um, to try to, to cope with some of these issues that we're seeing in our country today. All right. That is our last lecture for uh, the school year. So I hope everyone has a good summer. <laughs>